Welcome to the Deep Dive. We are slicing through the noise to get straight to the core of some critical research. And today, um, we're tackling a really fascinating area of consumer trust. We are. It's all about the cannabis potency label. Exactly. We're taking a deep look at this landmark statewide review out of Colorado. They examine hundreds of products to see if what's on the label you know, actually matches what's inside the package. So our sources, they lay out the findings from these Colorado researchers, and they conducted this uh, really first of its kind, large scale investigation. It's a big one. And what they found, well, it reveals some significant, even structural issues in how products are being tested and labeled. And we're talking specifically about flour and concentrates. Mm -hmm. The stakes here are, I mean, they're immense. It's not just about consumer wallets. Right. It's public safety. It's the fundamental trust in a regulated market. This deep dive is so essential because it's finally putting hard data behind what have been for a long time just industry suspicions. Mm -hmm. So for you, the consumer... The mission here is to understand whether that most crucial piece of information, that big potency number, is accurate and, you know, what happens when it's wrong. And this study really provides the first solid benchmark for accuracy in a modern legal market. To really get the uh, intensity of this conversation, I think we need to step back. Let's look at the history for a second. Set the stage. Yeah, let's set the stage for just how high THC content is now compared to the past. If you look back to, say, the 1980s, typical THC in cannabis flower was remarkably low. We're talking around 8%. 8%. That feels like ancient history now. Hmm. I mean, the potency of what's available today is just, it's fundamentally different. It is. This Colorado review found that the tested flower products, on average, are clocking in around 21% THC. Okay, so more than double. But the really extreme shift is in the smokable concentrates, you know, the oils, waxes, hash. Right. The average potency there jumps to a staggering 71% THC. And the researchers even found some samples pushing as high as 84%. 71% average and 84% max. I mean, that's not just potent. That's an entirely different category of drug than what was available decades ago. Exactly. And that rapid escalation in potency is precisely why the label accuracy is just. It's non-negotiable. There's no room for error. None. As the lead researchers emphasized, greater THC exposure is, you know, scientifically associated with greater risks, everything from dependency, cannabis use disorder, to other potential mental health complications. So if you're already operating with these ultra potent products, that dosage information has to be absolutely reliable. It has to be. Okay, so given that high potency, the methodology behind the whole investigation becomes really key. How did they even pull this off? I mean, with federal prohibition, most university labs can't even legally possess these products. Right, and this really highlights the uh, the creativity that's needed in cannabis research today. Federal restrictions meant the university team couldn't purchase or handle any of it directly. So what did they do? To maintain scientific integrity while still accessing the legal market, they had to collaborate. They partnered closely with an industry group, MedFarm Research. Ah, so that was the workaround. That partnership was the regulatory workaround that really made the whole study possible. So MedFarm, they hired the actual shoppers. They did. A secret shopper was deployed across a massive part of the state. They went to 52 dispensaries in 19 different counties. Yeah, a huge sample size. They collected 277 products. It was 178 flower items, including pre-rolls, and then... 99 smokable concentrates. That scale really does give us a representative look at the market. It does. Though it's important to note for you listening that this phase deliberately excluded edibles. Right. Good point. But once the samples were gathered, they were immediately delabeled, just numbered. And the chemists then tested those samples completely blind without knowing what potency the original labels claimed. So it was a truly unbiased analysis. Completely. And what standard were they measuring against? They didn't just... Uh create a new definition of what's acceptable, did they? No, they adopted Colorado's existing rule. Okay, so the state sets the bar. That's right. And products were considered accurately labeled only if their tested THC content fell within 15% of the number on the package. 15%, that threshold feels important. It's arguably a generous standard to begin with. It is quite generous. Yeah. If your label says 20% THC, the actual content could be anywhere from 17% to 23% and still pass. That raises a critical point about the regulation itself. Why 15%? I mean, if you're buying a prescription drug, the acceptable variance is tiny, right? Less than 5% often. 
Oh, much less. So is that 15% standard set because testing is just known to be inherently inconsistent? Or is it a sign that the industry may be pushed for a looser standard? It's likely a bit of both. That 15%, it does acknowledge the biological variability we're going to talk about, but it also reflects a regulatory environment that's often focused on, you know, allowing the industry to function without overly burdensome rules. But with those concentrates we mentioned. Exactly. When you have 84% concentrates, a 15% variance is huge. Yeah. yeah. It means a consumer expecting, say, 80% potency could be getting a product testing as low as 68% or as high as 92. That's a massive swing. Okay, let's get to the results because this is where the conversation just splits dramatically based on the product type. And we have to start with the problem area, the flour and pre-rolls. The results for flour were uh, frankly alarming. Huh. Almost half 34% of the flour products failed to meet that 15% accuracy standard. 44%. So nearly one out of every two flour purchases in the state was inaccurately labeled. According to the state's own metric, yes. That failure rate is just, it's massive. But here's the part that's confusing for the listener, and we need to reconcile this. The research also said that, on average, the difference between the labeled and the observed THC was only about 2%. Right. So how can 44% of products fail, yet the average difference is only 2%? That sounds like a tiny error. That is a fantastic question, and it is the key to understanding the whole systemic flaw here. Okay. That small 2% average difference, it masks these huge systemic individual failures. So it's a misleading average. Totally. Okay. Think of it this way. That 2% average is generated by blending major failures, like that product labeled 24%. That tested at 16, with lots of products that were maybe only slightly under or even slightly over. The average suggests everything's fine, but the failure rate screams inconsistency. So the 44% is telling us that nearly half the labels are inconsistent enough to break that 15% rule, even if the big errors are sort of canceled out by minor ones in the overall average? Precisely. It shows a huge consistency problem in the testing process itself. Labs just can't reliably hit the same number twice. And crucially, when you break down the nature of those failures, mm. The majority 54 of those products had inflated their THC content. They were made to look stronger than they really were. But how many were stronger than advertised? Only 23. So the direction of the error is mostly benefiting the seller, not you, the buyer. And that specific example, 24 on the label, 16 in the lab, I mean, that is a huge difference, especially if you're relying on that metric for a desired effect or for medical dosing. It's a world of difference. OK, now let's pivot to the success story here. The concentrates. Right. The concentrates, oils, waxes, they were near perfect. Only four of the 99 concentrate products they tested were found to be inaccurately labeled. Just four? Just four. That's an outstanding 96% compliance rate. It means virtually every concentrate product was meeting the state's own standard. 96%. It's almost perfect. So we have this really stark structural contrast. 44% failure for flour. 96% success for concentrates. This can't be random. What's the fundamental, maybe biological difference that makes testing flowers so much harder? Well, the primary reason, and the researchers cite this, is the biology of the plant itself, what they call the heterogeneity factor. Heterogeneity, so not uniform. Exactly. Concentrates are usually processed into homogeneous materials, like uniform oils or liquids. And once the substance is uniform, it's pretty easy to sample a tiny amount and get a result that accurately reflects the whole batch. But the flower is heterogeneous. It's a plant. It's a plant. The raw cannabis flower is physically complex. The potency can vary significantly depending on which part of the, you know, the cola or even the plant is sampled. It's just impossible to guarantee that the tiny bit they take for testing accurately represents the entire harvest. Or even the whole bag you buy at the dispensary. Yeah. Exactly. Testing a heterogeneous plant requires highly rigorous, complex, standardized sampling. And this study suggests the current system is, well, it's falling short. So there's the biological complexity, but the sources also pointed pretty strongly to a commercial factor. This idea that third-party testing labs are feeling pressure to inflate THC numbers. Yes. If the product is already so hard to test consistently, why wouldn't a lab just, you know, go with the highest number they find? And that's where the incentive structure kicks in, and it's a huge problem. Consumers have been trained for years to look for the high score. Right, the biggest number on the jar. Marketers want the highest possible number on their label because it drives sales. 
So the testing labs that consistently deliver high THC numbers are just more likely to get and keep the business. It creates a commercial feedback loop. A feedback loop that directly incentivizes scientific compromise. So the labs that are the most scientifically rigorous or maybe just report the true lower average, they might risk losing that lucrative business to a lab that's willing to deliver the number the marketer wants. It's a real conflict of interest. If that incentive is so strong, can regulation even fix this? I mean, do we need to consider something more radical, like state-run testing facilities that are independent of all that commercial pressure? That is the critical debate this research really opens up. The researchers themselves suggested that, you know, small procedural changes in testing could reduce mislabeling. So improve the current system. Right. But if we acknowledge that profit motive, the discussion has to shift toward greater transparency, maybe requiring labs to submit all their test results, not just the final one, or moving toward some kind of independent verification system. Because trusting labs that rely on the business of the people they're supposed to regulate is it's inherently problematic. That's a huge takeaway. But even if we could fix that 44% accuracy rate, the researchers pointed out an even deeper issue with what we're all looking at, the single-minded focus on just THC. Yes, this is so important. This focus creates a real disservice because we're just ignoring the overall chemical complexity of the plant. This is where the true potential of cannabis is just completely overlooked. I mean, Colorado law does require companies to list CBD amounts, and compliance there is pretty good about 80 to 85 percent. Okay, so they're doing that. But when they look for other compounds, they found that only 16 percent of products included any details about these lesser known cannabinoids. 16 percent. So compliance just drops off a cliff once you move beyond the two most famous acronyms. And the research highlighted two specific compounds that were widely present but almost never labeled, CBG and CBGA. And this is a really significant finding. Cannabigarol, or CBG, and its acid form, CBGA, appeared in higher concentrations than the labeled CBD across many of the product categories they tested. Wait, say that again? More CBG than CBD? In many products, yes. So think about that. You, the consumer, are buying a product thinking you're getting a certain amount of CBD, but you're actually getting more of a totally different unlabeled compound. So why should we care that we're getting more CBG and CBGA than the labeled CBD? Why is the presence of these compounds so relevant? It connects directly to the idea of the entourage effect. Ah, oh, right. We often simplify the cannabis experience down to just THC equals high, but the plant is a complex chemical library. The synergy between THC, CBD, and these minor cannabinoids like CBG and CBGA, that's what truly defines the user experience. Yeah. It can potentially modify or even mitigate the effects of the THC. So the entourage effect suggests the whole profile matters more than that single high number. So if I'm looking for, say, anti-inflammatory effects, and those are linked to CBG, mm -hmm. the current label is actively preventing me from making an informed choice, even though the compound I might need is right there in the product. Exactly. These compounds, CBG and its acid form, have been linked by researchers to potential anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiety, even neuroprotective effects. By focusing solely on THC and allowing the labeling system to ignore these other prevalent compounds, we're effectively forcing consumers into a high-score mentality. A mentality that overlooks what might be the most beneficial components for their actual intended use. That's right. The researchers strongly suggest expanding mandatory reporting to multiple other cannabinoids to give people a true, holistic, chemical profile of what they're buying. That is a really powerful conclusion. So to wrap up the scorecard for you, the flower market is just plagued by inconsistency and inflation. 44% of products failing the state's accuracy standard. Even as concentrates show near-perfect compliance. Right. And regardless of accuracy, the labeling system is fundamentally incomplete. It's failing to communicate the presence of these highly relevant, potentially beneficial minor cannabinoids like CBG and CBGA. And this initial investigation is already paving the way for change. The researchers are securing support to expand this work to that third big category, edibles. Good. And as legalization expands, these findings are just essential for guiding regulators who want to ensure consumer safety and build a functional, trustworthy industry. The ultimate challenge really remains this. If the industry's goal is to offer tailored, beneficial experiences, it has to move beyond just prioritizing the single metric of THC. We've seen the consequences of that. A pursuit of the highest number that compromises scientific accuracy, especially in flour. Yeah. Which leaves us with a profound question for you to think about. In a world where potency is the primary marketing tool, 
and the plant itself is inherently variable and inconsistent to test, how effective can regulation truly be in forcing transparency? And it makes you wonder what other consumer products reliant on just a label for you to gauge their value suffer from these same kinds of systemic inconsistencies. A huge challenge for science and for regulation moving forward. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive. We hope you feel much better informed now about the complexities behind that number on the package. We'll catch you next time.